Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Leaders Summit at X. My name is Mary Coyle, and I'm the Executive Director of the Frank McKenna Center for Leadership. And I'm Hannah Storty, and I'm the Vice President of the Students' Union, and I will be your co-host with Mary tonight. So we have something big coming up in Canada um, in just three days, actually, um, and that's a federal election. Um, so tonight is exciting for a lot of reasons, but I would invite you to think about or remember um, the importance of this election to come, what it means for change, and what it can mean for Canada. Um, the theme for the Leader Summit is building common ground, um, and that has a lot to do with democracy and with politics. So we'd invite you to reflect on that um, this evening and keep that in mind, as well as the importance of voting on Monday. Thank you, Hannah. Yes, we can't say that enough. I, anybody remember when we had Rick Mercer on campus? <laughs> right? Yeah. That was all about getting out the vote, right? And getting on TV for some people in the room, right? <laughs> Anyway, uh, thank you, Hannah. I think our students' union have done a spectacular job of uh, campaigning, uh, encouraging all of us on campus to, to get out and vote on Monday. So thank you for, for that reminder. It is part of leadership uh, and citizenship. Uh, I'd, I'd like to really warmly welcome absolutely everybody who's here tonight. It's a great crowd. Thank you for coming out. Uh, we also would like to welcome our U4 colleagues. We are being live streamed here, uh, and I think some of our St. of X alumni are also watching us, and some of our Masters of Education students who are not here on campus. So we have student groups at Bishops, at Mount Allison, and Acadia watching tonight. So welcome uh, at a distance. <laughs> And thank you for being with us. This summit, as, uh, as Hannah has said, is, uh, is called the Leader Summit at X, and our theme is Building Common Ground. This is our third Leader Summit at X. Uh, we've uh, really had a lot of success bringing the community together on our Friday night keynote, and I know this is going to be uh, just a spectacular evening. This uh, is... Uh, is really the signature event of the year for the Frank McKenna Center for Leadership. And uh, we've been working really hard with uh, student leaders, with uh, staff leaders, with faculty leaders here on the campus to put together a summit that uh, actually started last night. And we have this keynote tonight. And then all day tomorrow, we're going to be having panel discussions, workshops, and our students are going to be very much taking charge on identifying what their priorities are as leaders in our community. So that's what we're up to. Now, Frank McKenna's name is on the Frank McKenna Center for Leadership. He's a great Canadian and a great Canadian leader. What Frank really wanted and still wants for this center, and I think this is a perfect example of it, and you, some of you may have heard me speak of this before, Frank himself. Frank talks about meteors out, meteors in, and we like to talk about meteors within as well. So meteors out means St. of X students getting out in the world and experiencing the world and developing their leadership through that community interaction. Meteors in is what we've got going on here tonight. We've got a meteor who's arrived in Antigonish yesterday around maybe one or two in the afternoon. We couldn't quite track his, uh, the, the tail of that meteor, but uh, he showed up last night when we asked him to, so that was great. So I mean, he's a meteor that has come in to help really ignite the leadership here to inspire all of us. And we have, we feel, meteors within, you know, the, the people like Hannah and others who have helped put this together, and all of you who are, I know, going to feel inspired after Wob speaks tonight. So that's, that's what we're here for. Now, uh, I know some were here last night, but I'm, I have to tell a little story, because most of you were not with us last night, although we had a huge crowd at the McKay Room. So Joan Dillon, anybody in the audience know the wonderful Joan Dillon? Yeah. 
Joan Dillon is just a thorn in my side. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of you. Anybody been needled by Joan? Oh yeah, okay. So Lisa Lunny Borden, who's been a wonderful co-conspirator through the planning of all of this, uh, and I have been needled over the last couple of years by Joan Dillon from her bed in the R.K. McDonald. She's been after us saying, we got to get X Project reignited. We got to really get young people engaged again. We got to get more people excited about working together in the communities. We've got to get Wab Canoe. And we thought, how do you even know who Wab Canoe is? Well, as usual, Joan Dillon is way ahead of the rest of us. And she, when she saw Wab Canoe uh, perform hip hop on television, she said, that's the guy. We gotta get him to come to St. Evex because he is going to be the person to really get us charged up again in our community. And, uh, and so, to be honest, yes, we made the arrangements, but it was the hand of Joan Dillon that was working to bring Wab Canoe here tonight. And Wab, since he has arrived here, has been working very hard. We had a wonderful concert last night, community event. This morning and this afternoon, there were over 225 maybe high school kids from our Aboriginal communities and, and uh, African Nova Scotian communities from across the province here. Fabulous leadership gathering right in this room with Wab. Very inspirational. I was inspired by him. I was also inspired by the questions that those kids asked of, of him and of each other. Very impressive. And tonight, I'm going to hand it over to Hannah now because we're going to get on with this evening's agenda. Thank you. And before I invite Wab up to speak, I would like to invite Shana Francis and Robin Bourgeois to come do welcomes. Um, Robin is with the Cody Institute's International Center for Women's Leadership, and she leads Cody's Indigenous Women in Community Leadership Program. Can you hear me? Yeah, good? Okay. Go ahead, well, Darcy, but you die all the willog. Hello, Knagweg, I will Darcy, and I'm going to walk in your biggest thing. Can I quit the hostage? Ah, Jadida, welcome. Tonight I'm going to offer a song that actually usually comes at the end of events. Um, it is a traveling song, but many of us are quite literally on a journey tonight uh, to join us. All of you have journeyed here to come and hear this important talk, and I hope that all of us journey forward in this really incredibly important and large project of reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous folks in this country. So this is my song to all of us here tonight uh, to uh, send us off in a good way, to have a good journey, and to be united together. We are all treaty people.
you so much, Robin and Shana, for those beautiful welcomes. And I would now like to introduce and invite up a St. Evac student and athlete, Tasha McKenzie, to introduce our special guest, Wild Canoe. <laughs> It's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker tonight, Wab Canoe. Named by Post Media News as one of nine Aboriginal movers and shakers you should know, so this means he's one of the most important Aboriginals in Canada, Wab Canoe is a First Nations broadcaster, musician, author, and activist. His father, Tabasana Quit, a graduate of the Cody Institute here at St. Avex, was both a beloved traditional chief and a respected elected leader who engaged directly with Ottawa. Wab's book, The Reason You Walk, is an inspiring piece that offers a vision for family and cross-cultural reconciliation and a wider conversation about the future of Aboriginal peoples. From his unique vintage point, he offers an inside view of what it means to be an educated Aboriginal living in a country that is just beginning to wake up to its Aboriginal history and live in presence. In addition to his writing, Wab is the Associate Vice President for Indigenous Relations at the University of Winnipeg and a correspondent with Al Jazeera America. He has a BA in Economics and completing a Master's Degree in Indigenous Governments and is a member of the Meta One Society. Wab is also an honorary witness for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Please put your hands together with me for welcoming, welcoming Wab Canoe. Miigwech. Ulala. Ulalik. I'm going to show you another way we're going to talk about the Quit Nigo. Quit Quit Kibana is a Zavi Tangman addition to us. We should go shine to them. Kaka was so nigga ming in the OJ. I'm a change. You can't jump in Jayan or my Mig Magi. And I'm going to go to the Mig Magi Shinabe. I'm going to go to the Mig Magi Shinabe. I'm going to go to the Mig Magi Shinabe. Shigodash Ogoe Gakana Kikino Mate Ediniwak Shigodash Kikino Mate Kwewak Ga Widoka Widoka Wig Misugo Menekana Bachin the Kit. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the, <laughs> the secret to reconciliation in Canada today. So let's move right into the Q&A. Any questions? <laughs> no, I always like I always like to begin in the, the language that I grew up with, Ojibwe, because I like to pay homage and honor the uh, elders in the way that they taught us to introduce ourselves back home, but also to tell you that I'm very proud to know an indigenous language. And when I come here to Mi'kma'ki, I'm always very proud to see the strength of your language and not just the fluent speakers amongst the elderly, but also the fluent speakers amongst the young. It makes me very proud and makes my heart, uh, you know, very strong. So I want to acknowledge the territory of the Big uh, Mon Nation, and thank you all for welcoming me. I'm uh, not here to tell you how to do things in your own backyard. I'm just here to share a few observations of things that I've seen along the way, and maybe there'll be something in there that uh, you can think about and maybe use if you see fit. I also want to uh, acknowledge those uh, signatories of the Peace and Friendship Treaties, whose uh, foresight leads the way to what uh, reconciliation, what this project might look like in Canada today. Peace and friendship. And of course, I also honor those agreements because What's written in those texts, combined with last year's Chilcotin decision, handed down by the Supreme Court, tells you that we're not just in the 
traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq Nation, we are in the literal territory of the Mi'kmaq Nation. And these lands have never been given up or surrendered by the indigenous nation that calls this place home. So we are truly their guests. And if that poses any questions in your mind, or if that's unclear, then, well, maybe uh, it's time that you dive deeper into uh, indigenous education, indigenous culture, and indigenous contemporary issues. So I stand before you guys a very, very humble, very humbled guy. You know, it's been amazing to be here at St. FX and to see like the, the remarkable work that's being done. You heard about, uh, you know, Joan and uh, Joe and the, uh, the X project, but also, you know, the Cody Institute and the uh, McKenna Leadership Institute. It really makes me proud to see the work that's being done here. Because I'm a big believer that a university should not be an ivory tower. University shouldn't be an island for the elite to sit around and pontificate. A university should be part of the community, should be part of the town, should be part of the neighborhood, and should reach out beyond its campus and help to spread knowledge and opportunity and celebrate uh, the wisdom of local peoples. And I'm very proud to say that's what we do at the University of Winnipeg, back home where I work. But I'm also very happy to see that that's what you guys are doing right here in Nova Scotia. So you should really give a round of applause to Mary and Joan and Joe. And everybody like that. So on the theme of leadership, I wanted to really just share a few examples of, uh, uh, of what I thought were really compelling um, you know, leaders from, from our community. Because you look at like, the, the people who've come from our nations, like you know, a Phil Fontaine or a Sean Atlio, going all the way back to like, you know, like the, 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 the famous warriors of the past, like Tecumseh or Crazy Horse. I want to tell you that those people didn't arise by accident. Those people didn't just come out of nowhere to be the people that they are. They were cultivated by our communities. They were cultivated by the elders back home. And our elders in indigenous communities are very intentional about creating leaders, right? They identify people when they're young and they shepherd them along. And I'm sure Leroy can tell you the same thing, that he was identified by his community and told to get educated, told to understand his people's ways, and then called back to serve his community. This is how it goes in our community. So indigenous nations have a thing or two to teach uh, the world about uh, leadership. And I was reminded of this a few years back. I was speaking at a conference on the intergenerational effects of residential schools. So it was a heavy, heavy day, and very emotional issues. So I went into this room, the elders room, where they had like a smudge set up and you know, you could go smudge there. So I was smudging myself and I was feeling all holy and sacred. And I realized that there was an old man there watching me from the corner. He's like, hey, are you Wabi Ginu? He speaks Ojibwe, I could tell though, by the way he said my name. And I was like, uh, yeah, that's me. He's like, oh, cool. My kids like your music. My grandkids like your music. I was like, oh, right on. So we got to talking a little bit, and I gave him a CD, and he was like taken aback that I'd give him this CD. He's like, oh, it's amazing. So we're saying our goodbyes and see you again. And as I got up to leave, he said, hold on, hold on. I got a gift for you, too. He reached in his uh, backpack. It's an old Ojibwe guy, so he's got a backpack, right? <laughs> he pulled out this gift, and he gave it to me. You know what that gift was? It was a fried bologna sandwich. <laughs> so you know it's a true story. still wrapped in tin foil and it was still warm. <laughs> I was like that because it, 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 it just shows the generosity, right? Like that's one of the values. It's not unique to indigenous people, but it's one of the things that we celebrate and we, we prize in our communities as generous people. So this guy literally gave me his lunch, right? That he came to the conference with. And it also kind of shows how we're a little bit goofy too. So, <laughs> so that's good. And I know what you guys are wondering. I ate it. I ate the sandwich. <laughs> so, 
So that's an example of uh, you know, a, a leader maybe more humble than the great war chiefs of the past, but one who can teach us some important lessons uh, uh, all the same. So the, the, the talk title that uh, we agreed on was you know, put the people first. And where this came from you know, in my life was uh, at the Sundance. So the Sundance is like a very intense Thanksgiving ceremony that we practice in the you know, eastern woodlands, plains areas across North America. So it's you know, traditional for the Anishinaabe and the Sioux and the uh, Cree and the Blackfoot. And uh, there's even a Sundance now in uh, Big Cove in Elsa Booktuk, right? William Nevin runs that one. And so it's a very powerful ritual. We, we, we fast, we dance for four days, and then there's a piercing ceremony that's a part of it too. So I was at the Sundance a few years back. You know, I was in the zone, right? So I'm like dancing there, and I'm all like, again, real holy and real sacred. And then this lady, this Hayoka, like a spiritual woman, she comes in front of me and she starts yelling at me. Eh? I was like, whoa, this is intense. But what she said was really profound. It was really, really important. She said, put the warriors first. Put the women first. Put the children first. Put yourself last. Okay. She repeated it. You know, If you want to be a leader, here's what you got to do. You got to put the warriors first, put the women first, put the children first, and put yourself last. And I really like that, right? Because it shows how, like, in our community, being the leader, it's not about like you know, standing up on stage in the spotlight like I'm doing right now. It's not about like big paycheck. It's not about like uh, the title, right? Being a leader in the true traditional indigenous sense of the word, an ogima, it's about service. It's about serving your people, all those other people who are counting on you. So I really like that. And it's my belief, you know, that we're in this amazing time, amazing time, right? What a time to be alive. Got that new Drake and Future mixtape. <laughs> but I liked it a lot, because I think it's, it's true. Like, what a time to be alive, right? Like, we're in this era where we can have things that were never possible in the past, you know, appear to be commonplace, right? One of the most famous NHL players now is Carey Price, right? Most important artist in this country, according to the Globe and Mail, is Tanya Tagak. Most important novelist is Joseph Boyden, right? And I believe fully that in my lifetime, probably in the next decade, we'll have the first Indigenous Prime Minister of this country. Right? And so it is amazing. But we need to get past the firsts, right? Because I'm not interested in being the first anything. My attitude, my mentality is I'm trying to be the best, right? So I'm not trying to be the first novelist. I'm trying to be the best writer. You know, I'm not trying to be the first politician from my community. I'm trying to be the best leader from my community. So we're in this interesting time where that sort of discussion is now possible. But it's frustrating, to be honest with you, that at the same time that I am no word of a lie promising you that we're going to have an indigenous prime minister in this country, that we already have a Native American astronaut, that we already have like hundreds of indigenous medical doctors across this country, that at the very same time, the very same time that all that progress is possible, there's still tens of thousands of kids in my community growing up without clean drinking water that there's 110,000 First Nations kids in this school who are going to school on reserve in academic settings that get, on average, $4,000 less per student per year than provincial schools do. Is that consistent with the revision of Canada? No. Is that consistent with the values embodied in the charter? At the same time that we have that great success, same time my little sister is finishing up her PhD at Harvard University, it's also true that if she comes back to this country, she'll be four times more likely to be murdered than a woman from another cultural community. So there's this huge disconnect, right, between the potential that's being realized and the fact that every young indigenous person who goes out there and grabs a piece of success 
is adding another nail in the coffin of the racist attitudes of the past and showing that they were mistaken because the thing that prevented us from achieving was never anything to do with our genetics, but it was merely an accident of the racist policies of the past which held us back. Right? At the same time that that's all being proven by every young indigenous person, we also have to face facts that there are some extreme inequities which continue to persist in this country, which continue to persist in this land that we love so much, right? And I get it, it's upsetting. It's, when I talk like this, it's edgy. Oh, wow, Canoe, he's got an edge, you know? I get it. Like, I went to school just like everyone else here, singing Old Canada in the morning, you know? Painting pictures of the maple leaf. I know the values of this country. I know what this country dreams for itself and what it is capable of being. What I'm saying is, let's live up to those values. Let's be honest about the truth of our situation today. Commit to working together to respond to those things. And then move from truth on to reconciliation. Huh? So this Guys in South Africa, like Dev, Desmond Tutu, when they put that phrase together, truth and reconciliation, they were really onto something. They really understood. Before you can talk about this, you have to have honesty. You have to have clear eyes and see what the reality of the situation is. So that's one of the things that I, that I think, and I think that we don't necessarily have to wait for reconciliation to occur in order for indigenous people to start contributing some of the wealth of our cultures to the global community. Rather, it's in this journey of reconciliation itself that we can start living those values and start sharing with the world. This is the strength and the wisdom and the beauty that we've always known in our homes, in our nations, in our communities. So I wanted to share some of those with you and do a few little thought experiments about how might indigenous ways of knowing help us respond to the great challenges, great issues of our time. So I thought I'd talk about a few, few of the big challenges that we're confronted with nowadays. The uh, issue of income inequality, the environment, the global war on terror, and the question of accommodation for minorities in a pluralistic, secular society. Because I think these are some of the issues that we're we're really confronted with and asked to, to respond to. And I thought I'd share maybe a few ideas of how an indigenous way of looking at those challenges uh, might suggest that we operate a little differently than the status quo. So the first issue, income inequality, right? Basically, people have known this for a long time as the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. But it's actually been systematized, right, and like studied in the academic context. There's a great book by Thomas Piketty, which came out last year, in which he basically, using a big data set going over the past few hundred years, he showed how inequity is basically built into the structure of capitalism. And it's not some like crazy communist manifesto analysis. No, he's saying very simply this. People who earn their income from capital, meaning from earning machines or business, get a better rate of return on those things than do people who earn their income from labor, from wages. And that can be a very small gap, but compounded over hundreds of years, that gap always grows bigger, right? And so some you know, conservative scholars have tried to critique his methodology. He's refuted most of those arguments that I've seen, and nobody else has really worked on the scale of that data that he is. So I take his analysis to be pretty pretty accurate if maybe his solutions are a little lacking. So what would an indigenous approach have to say about the question of income inequality? Well, I want to tell you about something else that I heard growing up at the Sundance. One thing that they used to tell us is uh, the chief should be the poorest one in the community. And I'm not taking a shot at you, Leroy. This is not a, <laughs> I'm not on that like Canadian Taxpayers Federation thing. Because they're not talking about elected leadership at the Sundance when they're saying this. They're talking about a grassroots leader. They're saying, do you want to be a leader in your home community? Then you should be the poorest one in your community. Right? You want to be the leader? As long as there's somebody hungry, you should give them your food. You want to be the leader? As long as there's someone cold, you should give them your blanket. As long as there's somebody sad, 
you should use your songs, your medicine, your knowledge to help make them feel better. That's the indigenous I ideal of leadership at work. Chief should be the poorest one in the community. And that's why I don't want to be chief, right? Because I like, you know, the fancy things in life. <laughs> Stuff doesn't buy itself, you know? <laughs> no, but I, I'm, just, I'm just joking. But uh, think about that for a second. Imagine you were raised in a, in, a, in a culture, in a community that told you that the leaders should be the poorest ones. And then you went from that culture and then you became a chief executive officer. You were told the chief should be the poorest one in the community, and then you became a chief operating officer or a chief technology officer. Might you look at things a little bit differently? Would you take home a compensation package that was 100 or 1,000 times greater than the average of what your employees are earning? Maybe not. Maybe you'd look at things a little bit differently. So perhaps there's room for us to uh, change how we view each other change how we view our uh, responsibilities and our obligations, uh, not just to ourselves and the incentives that we uh, are entitled to, not just what we deserve, but that we also might think about what we owe, what we owe to the culture, to the community, whether that's a literal village or a corporate community, campus community, things like that. On the issue of the global war on terror, it is a, it is a legit, Crisis, right? Like we're talking about truth and reconciliation here in the Canadian context. I believe the same ideals could benefit us in some of the uh, foreign showdowns, right? But could we talk to Putin about reconciliation over Crimea? Is ISIS prepared to talk about reconciliation for parts of Syria and Iraq? Probably not. Right? The trouble I think that we're having in this country in particular is that the debate on how to respond to some of the challenges around the, the global war on terror is that it immediately gets boiled down to, at least, to either, oh, we gotta be 100% pacifist and there only for a peacekeeping mission to the other extreme, which is, if you're not with us, you're with the terrorists. And we don't have any space in our public sphere for a more intelligent, more nuanced debate of some of the gray areas which may lie in between. And I get it, you know? Like, I'm working for Al Jazeera America, I reported from Yemen, you know? I've reported from Turkey for other uh, media outlets, you know? I've been a few spots in the Middle East, and I've spoken to people, and I know that we're not gonna win over all the bad boys with an olive branch. So you do need, sometimes, to be able to respond with force. But by the flip side, we're not going to win long term with drone strikes and with Navy SEALs. We need those tools sometimes to respond to grave threats to our freedom and to our security. But in the long run, we're not going to win, because when I talk to people in Yemen that you would consider an extremist, what they told me is they're not fighting for ideological reasons. They're fighting because their relatives were killed as collateral damage in drone strikes, right? So as long as we don't differentiate and as long as we just see one big mass and we simplify all the situations in these um, theaters of war, we're never going to be able to make a positive step forward. So what would an indigenous approach have to say about this? Well, I want to introduce you to my uh, friend Tatanka Iatanke here. He's probably recognized from t-shirts and posters. Sitting Bull is his uh, English translation of his name. What he said was, in order for there to be peace, it's not necessary for eagles to be crows. You know, remarkable bit of uh, insight. Right? Because he's saying we don't have to be exactly alike or live the same kind of life in order for us to get along and have peace uh, with one another. But what's even more important than those words is the context in which he spoke them. He said that during the Indian Wars. He said that when the American cavalry were slaughtering women and children from his nation. And yet even in the height 
of that conflict in that theater of war, he saw fit to recognize the humanity of his enemy. Do we do the same? For sure, we're not going to be able to have reconciliation with Putin, or we're not going to be able to have reconciliation with the Islamic State. But do we recognize that the grassroots Syrian person, the grassroots Iraqi, has a humanity that needs to be respected? And they have a right to live and to security of person and to pursue their own happiness? Right? I think maybe we could use a little reminder of that, especially our politicians could use a reminder of that more and more often. Whoop. Gave you a little sneak preview there. <laughs> We're going to the Vatican. <laughs> the environment, like listen, there is, there is a scientific consensus that climate change is real and that it is man-made, right? And look at the defini definition of consensus. It doesn't mean unanimity. There is a small fringe that's funded by the oil industry that disagrees. You know? But the broad consensus is that climate change is real. But there's also a legitimate debate that needs to be had about, all right, how do we balance a response to climate change and environmental protection with our need to have a living? The fact that all of us use petroleum, if not in our transportation, then in our clothing, or in our phones, you know, or in our electronic devices. Right? There's, none of us have a zero carbon footprint. Right? So we have to find some way to balance between those two concerns. Well, what would the indigenous people say? What would the traditional indigenous culture have to say about that? Well, it's pretty difficult to destroy the earth when you see the earth as your mother. Right? It's difficult to cause intense damage to the natural surrounding when you see you know, not just in a, like a, a, a symbolic way that the animals and the plants and stuff are your relatives, but in a very real, literal way, in our languages, we speak of those things the same way that we speak of uh, human beings, right? We see them in a very, even in our languages, as having the same value as us. So if the balance of power right now is swung way in favor of economy at the expense of environment, then bringing a more indigenized approach might encourage us to swing that pendulum back in another direction. And I wanted to talk about the issue of accommodation, particularly the issue of religious accommodation in a secular state, because I think it's a super fascinating philosophical discussion to have, which is how much room should there be for practitioners of a given faith uh, to occupy the public sphere. And apart from being an interesting philosophical discussion, it's also become a very politicized discussion in this recent, uh, or in the current federal election because of all the attention paid to the niqab, right? But let's just pause the discussion on the niqab because real quick, there's an internal controversy between the position of opposing the niqab and supporting the sale of arms to Saudi Arabia, right? So we can set that whole, cut, right? Because real quick, who is exporting the Wahhabist brand of Islam that is responsible for spreading the niqab and the abaya in the Arabian Peninsula? Saudi Arabia. So if you oppose the niqab in Canada, you can't run around to the other side of the world and start, you know, being a big ally of Saudi Arabia. It's inconsistent. We'll put that aside for a second. The question that I hear at the University of Winnipeg related to religious accommodation is why should we have an opening prayer for indigenous people if this is a non-denominational university? Right? And I think that's an interesting one. The quick answer is indigenous people occupy a unique space in this country, right? And that's recognized in our constitution. We have a unique class of rights. And again, if you don't understand those things, and Intro to Aboriginal Law would be a great course to check out. But beyond that, right, there is this kind of like shifting boundary between secularism and uh, spirituality. 
that we're constantly negotiating in our societies, in the modern world. But to me, like the most personal example that this brings up is the idea of uh, this barbaric cultural practices tip line. Because I'm a sun dancer, right? And if the niqab scares you, I wonder what you would think about me with my shirt off and like two uh, pieces of wood dug in and cut into my chest. And like, you know, blood streaming down. Because that's what my religion looks like. Right? And I'll tell you what, we continued practicing that even when it was outlawed in this country. We continue to practice it today after those legal prohibitions have been removed. And even if you call a tip line on me, we're going to continue practicing those things. Right? So, I believe in civil, civil liberties, right? I believe in civil rights, and I believe in like the rights that are protected in the Charter, especially the freedom of religion, right? And I don't believe that we can carve out, you know, exceptions to that, that uh, suits our, you know, political whims, right? So what would the indigenous approach have to say with this? Well, remember the words of Tecumseh. Trouble no man about their beliefs, but allow no man to trouble yours. Right? Or like what I said in the introduction, I'm not here how to, to tell you guys how to do things in your own territory. I'm just here talking about some of the stuff that I've seen and some of the stuff that I've done. So that's the indigenous approach to religious accommodation. But again, that's not a hard and fast rule, because what happens if what you're doing in your territory starts running downstream and affecting what I'm doing in my territory? Eh? Well, that's why we've got to have a process of reconciliation, a process for negotiation. So what does that look like? Well, earlier I kind of alluded to the residential school era. And... Uh, my father, you know, was the one in our immediate family who bore the brunt of that uh, past trauma, taken away from his family as a boy, put in St. Mary's Indian Residential School, you know, told in a language that he did not speak that his name was not Tabasanaquit. His name was, in fact, Peter Kelly. His parents had it wrong all those years. And he was told that he had a number, number 54 unbeknownst to him. Okay? And then while he was there, he experienced the horror stories. I think you know what I mean by that. But one of the things that we also learned, thanks to the research of Dr. Ian Mosby, is that he and likely hundreds of other kids at St. Mary's were the subject of nutritional experiments. And that the experiments conducted at St. Mary's Indian Residential School were also part of a national program of experiments. So these federal government scientists came into the residential school and they saw these starving children and they didn't think, as Dr. Ian Mosby said, they didn't think, hey, let's feed these starving kids. They said, hey, let's uh, design a controlled experiment to run on these children. So that happened in this country within living memory. Right? And I'm, I'm not saying it to you know, play the blame game or make you feel some kind of way about it. I'm just saying it to illustrate the severity of what happened so that you can understand what happened next, right? Starting in the 90s with Phil Fontaine stepping forward and telling his story and the survivors of uh, Shubenacadie Residential School beginning to organize and collect their stories, all of a sudden the residential school issue started to come out into the national uh, public sphere. And then the class action lawsuits filed. Again, Shubenacadie amongst the first actors in that. And then uh, that led to the residential school settlement agreement, the apology in 2008. And, you know, full credit to Stephen Harper for delivering the apology. Don't agree with much else of what he does, but he is the one who stood up and apologized, and that was a great moment for Canadians. And so something began in those years for my old man. That which he had been traumatized by, that which had caused so much division between us, started to become 
open and okay to talk about, right? And I'll tell you real quick, like, how the intergenerational legacy of residential schools works, or at least in our family, how it works. The priests and nuns raised my father with harsh discipline in a very abusive fashion. They did not love him, right? And that made him feel a certain kind of way, anger, powerless, right? When he raised me, though his methods were not as severe, he raised me with those same parenting tools that were used on him. And I felt the same way, anger and powerlessness, right? So the book that uh, I wrote, The Reason You Walk, the discovery that I made as I was writing it was, holy cow, not just that's what happened to him and here's what happened to me, but as I was writing it, I reflected and realized I'm making my sons feel the exact same way more often than I would like. You know? I want to be super dad. I want to be like Mr. Like cultivating resiliency amongst my children and all that. But when they're like running around in Starbucks or they're not listening at the grocery store, I'm too quick to temper. I'm too impatient. And I may make little cutting remarks against them that I know are very harmful to a young person's sense of self-esteem. So like our family, we're doing fine. We're all professionals. We're all educated. None of us are on the streets. You know, we're not addicts. And yet we're still impacted by the residential school era. So that's what that looks like, you know? So I want to share with that, share you guys with that, share that with you guys. <laughs> Third time's a charm. So that began to be okay to talk about, and then we started working on that reconciliation as a family. And then so my father traveled to the Vatican, and people have criticized this Pope, Pope Benedict, because he didn't say sorry. When he met the residential school survivors, he expressed his sorrow. So I asked my dad about that. I said, did you, like, uh, what did you think about that? And he said, well, I resolved I'm going to offer him the eagle feather, because I know that actions speak louder than words. If I offer him the eagle feather and he doesn't take it, then I'll know that what he's saying does, has no meaning. Nothing has changed. But I offer him the feather and he takes it, then I'll know that he's genuine. So there he was. I don't know if he learned that sort of uh, audacity while he was here at Cody. <laughs> yeah, you guys are taking credit for it. <laughs> so here it was. Some native guy from the bush in the middle of northwestern Ontario comes up and he's audacious enough to offer the eagle feather to the Pope, knowing full well that everyone around the world knows that the eagle feather is a symbol of indigenous spirituality. You see what happened next. Right? So it's a remarkable moment to see stuff like this happen because it tells you what was impossible a generation ago is possible today. Right? And that opens something up for the old man and he became free to practice his spirituality in a very authentic way, right? Because following his residential school experience, he returned to the Red Road, the indigenous spirituality, and that helped to put him back together on a personal level, on a spiritual level. But yet some part of him had been forged during all those Sundays spent at Mass. Some part of him was indelibly imprinted with Catholicism as a boy. So now later on in life, he had that veil of racism lifted from the church, and he was now free to express his spirituality in whatever may, way made sense to him. And some days that looked like a Sundancer, but on other days, he may have went to Mass too. So that was a very, very powerful time for us. And during this journey, one day he's telling me, you know what, I think... Uh, I think I'm going to adopt the archbishop. What do you think? I was like, ah, that sounds good. Was like scratching at an itch, itch that wasn't there. And I was like, yeah, that sounds all right. Because in my head at the time, like thinking like a young man, I'm like, why would you, why would you do that to the people who did you wrong? Like, is this another example of like the native guy bending over backwards for the non-indigenous person and then getting little in return? But I had too little understanding at the time, right? I was thinking very much like a young man. So all this is going on in like the thought bubble above my head. Then I'm thinking like, well, who cares? I'll just let the old man do his thing and I'll just stay on the outside of the circle with keep my reservations to myself. And this is when my dad interrupted me and he said, and I want you to conduct the adoption ceremony. <laughs> like, all right, okay, let's do it. 
So you see, it happened in early 2012. My father, his uncle Fred, or my uncle Fred, his brother Fred, Phil, and uh, Phil's brother Bert, together they adopted the Archbishop of Winnipeg. Okay. And so on this day, I was urged to step outside of my young man's way of thinking and to recognize that when somebody does you wrong, you shouldn't feel a need to prove your male ego and respond with revenge or retribution that you would be better off to rise above those feelings of negativity and respond with the true human character at its best, which is with love and with compassion and with grace and courage. And so it was a remarkable thing to see these you know, guys from the church who had been talking about turning the other cheek to be greeted by these residential school survivors who had been treated so poorly by the supposed emissaries of God and telling them instead, it's okay. We love you anyways, and you're our brother nonetheless. Okay? And so forgiveness walks. And I was very privileged to see it. And so to me, that's a, a remarkable thing. It's a remarkable thing too, like we should really honor these residential school survivors. Because we talk about that story and often it's just the story of loss. Often it's just the story of the pain that was caused. And yeah, for sure there was a lot of pain. Believe you, me, we know. But there's also a remarkable story of resilience and survival and inspiration. Because you think about that, it started when they were this big, right? And they had the combined weight of the Canadian state and the five churches and the Roman Catholic Church levied against them. And they survived that. Right? And they waited a long time. They waited for the country to change, for people to change, for the churches to change, and finally, for those to return to them and tell them, we were wrong all along. You were always right. You always had the, the right to be who you are. Right? That's a remarkable journey, because who here would have put their money in the 1930s on the little native kids to win that showdown? And who won in the end? Who were the victors? Who showed us the lesson on how to be a good human being? It was the little boys and girls who were taken away from their families and survived. And today we know them as the residential school survivors. So I hope that we recognize that too. And when we talk about that story, we don't just talk about the pain and the loss. We also talk about the amazing courage, the grace, and the example of how to be a good person that is embodied in each and every one of those stories. And that's why I believe that one of the most important recommendations in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission final report is near the end, which tells us that we should have a national, federal, statutory holiday in this country in honor of residential school survivors. And that's a powerful example of leadership. To me, that is the best kind of leadership, right? That's the kind of leader that I would aspire to be someday, right? That when somebody attacks you, you don't view that as a trigger to respond, but rather as that person revealing some of their inner flaws to you. And that you are good enough and wise enough to respond with compassion and to help them understand the error of their ways. And that you might lead them towards a more full realization of their inner humanity. To me, that's the best kind of leader that any of us could ever hope to become. And so I hope that we understand the lesson that uh, these indigenous elders have to offer us today. And we have this holy time, a very sacred time now where they're with us and they can share their stories with us. But we need that statutory holiday for that time a generation from now or two generations from now when they can no longer tell, the, tell us their stories and so that we will honor them and we will remember those stories at that time. So I think you start to see like why I feel so proud of uh, the leaders and the young people in my community because I see the potential because I know that some part of the answer to the great challenges of our time can come from the indigenous community, can come from indigenous people. And that's why I get excited. 
And some days that's why I get frustrated too. Because I'm still forced to argue with why should a First Nations kid get an equal shot at life? When to me that's like kindergarten stuff and I'm over here trying to have the grad school conversation. Right? So let's get with it. Let's do the easy stuff. Is there anybody here who really believes that a First Nations kid shouldn't have an equal, equally funded education? Absolutely not. Like if you're a progressive, that should offend your sense of social justice. If you're a conservative, that should offend the ideal that we just give everyone in life an equal start and then we get out of their way after that. Right? So let's get on with it. Then we can get into the more interesting conversations like land. But underlying that, and the value that my father embodied in our language, we know it as Kije Watiziwin. There is no English term, but it's like living a life of love and kindness and sharing and respect. Right? But I guess we would just say it's like living a, a good life, a moral life, an ethical life. It's how we would know that in English. And this is not something that's exclusive to indigenous people. This is the same value that wise men and wise women the world over have known since time immemorial. I'm not claiming that this is something only indigenous people know. All I'm saying is that some of the strongest examples for understanding how to embody that in this part of the world comes from some of our elders and some of their lived experience. So I would hope that we're able to harness that potential, to learn from these things, and to really step up and meet the great challenges of our time, you know, with peace and friendship in our hearts. And why? Well, I think about that time a generation from now, two generations from now, you know, God willing, if I'm still here, my child or my grandchild will come to me and ask me, what did you do in that historic moment? What did you do when women from all walks of life were standing up and demanding to be able to be free of violence and harassment? What did you do when the oceans were rising? What did you do when little indigenous children were asking for the right to be able to go to a safe, comfy school in their own communities. What did you do? Well, how I want to live my life, if I'm lucky to be able to lead anybody, what I would like to be able to answer them with is, I'd like to look them directly in the eye and say, I did what I could. And now I expect you to do the same. So with that, I'll say, miigwech kapizindaw yek, wilaliuk. Thank you guys very much for listening to me tonight. You guys ever watch uh, Columbo? Is that, is that too dated of a... How about Steve Jobs when he always does the uh, Apple, Apple unveilings? Just one more thing, right? So are we doing a Q&A? Well, thank you so much, Wob, for that incredible speech. I don't know if anyone in the room isn't just mind blown and so inspired right now. And we're lucky enough, actually, Wob has said he'll do a Q&A now. And I was lucky enough to pester him with a lot of questions earlier, so I can guarantee that he is very patient. Um, so I would just now like to open the floor if anybody has a question. I think we might also be taking some from Twitter as well. Um, so we might as well make the most of the incredible opportunity we have with this brilliant man who's in the room right now. So are there any questions? Yeah, I see a hand up there. Um, I guess I want to ask a question about um, other minorities in Canada. So I think of the 
Canadian people give people in Nova Scotia specifically, and even immigrant populations, religious minorities, this sort of thing, and the role that they have to play in reconciliation. So you can kind of talk about like the dominant culture and, and see minorities as the other, and, and this sort of, but how is it that the others can interact in a positive way? Well, like in terms of the academic discourse, like we're also seen as the other, right? Like indigenous academics like use Franz Fanon and Edward Said and all these, you know, scholars um, to help frame how we understand how indigenous peoples in the Americas are treated. So that's the first thing that I would say. But what I would say is the following. Um, the task of reconciliation may have begun because of a conflict between the descendants of indigenous people and the descendants of Europeans, but it will be realized by the descendants of people from all over the world, right? And so it's not mere, like, I hear people in my community even talk about, like, white people should do this and native people should do that, and it's like, well, like what country are you living in? Like, that looks nothing like the country that I know today, right? Like, there's people from all walks of life here now and those racial categories, they don't, one, they don't exist. Two, they don't apply, right? So I would encourage people to, to, to see beyond that. And there are some elders who have encouraged me to think the same way, like you know, Eugene, uh, Eugene Arcan, he's told me, well, when you speak, don't ever say the word white. Just say non-native, right? And uh, I think he's getting at something else with that, but uh, it's for another, another topic. Like what I would say is like we all, we all have a role to play, right? Like if the residential school experience makes you feel some kind of way, it's not so that you feel guilty or you feel blame or that you feel like you should atone for the sins of the father. That's not what it's about. If you feel some kind of way about that, then harness that sentiment to tackle some of the challenges that exist today either as a result of that past era or that exists as a um, rough parallel to that past era. What do I mean by that? I mean, if that offends you, and I think every Canadian is offended by that past era, the residential school era, then help challenge the legacies that continue to exist in the indigenous community as a result in the child welfare system, in the educational system, in the inequity between the various levels of government, right? And the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has also has laid like a, um, a remarkable roadmap for how to respond to those things, right? With their 94 recommendations. But I would say also what the TRC report identified as being the root cause of the residential school era being the root cause of racist ideas of the past like the doctrine of discovery which said that non-Catholics couldn't own their own land and was used to justify colonization the world over, and what still underlies a lot of the mistaken policies used to engage with indigenous peoples today, the thing that underlies all those things is the attitude of cultural superiority. What do you think underlines the proposals around a barbaric cultural practices hotline that underlines the discussion around the niqab? It's an attitude of cultural superiority, right? So I would argue that if that past era offends you, not only should you feel an obligation to try and respond to the challenges that indigenous people face, we should really live up to that ideal of never again and try and respond to that sort of bigotry wherever it exists, even if it is, yeah. Whether it be Islamophobia, whether it be directed at newcomers of other walks of life, whether it be gender discrimination, you know, or, you know, transphobia, all those things we should feel offended by, right? And we should use it as a chance to respond. And I mean that to my own community as well, because sometimes people are like, well, why should we go help in Haiti? And why should we go help overseas when we have third world conditions right here? No, I get that. I know we have third world conditions right here, but it doesn't mean that we can't also, at the same time, try and respond to the global challenges as well. So when, in my personal life, when I do volunteerism and when I like, donate money, 
I for sure donate a lot of my time and money to indigenous causes and try and help out in my own backyard, but I also try and donate to Médecins Sans Frontières, right? Or I also try and volunteer in the immigrant and refugee community as well, because I think we can do both. And if we are a socially minded person, then we shouldn't be looking for divisions. We shouldn't be looking for, you know, reasons to not act. We should be looking rather for ways that we can help as many people as possible. Yeah. There's a question at the back. I think if you could generalize, it's because no one's ever tried to actually listen to us, right? Like, you're going to spend billions of dollars on a group of people, like, how about listen to them for once, right? Like, that would be a novel concept, right? And so what I'm hopeful of the Discourse on Reconciliation um, accomplishing is that it continues to shift that uh, onus to engage in a real meaningful way with indigenous people on the federal government. And I am confident that it is happening. Because one of the things that I've noticed is that um, even the right wing today is more progressive on indigenous issues than the left wing was in the 1960s. Right? And so there has been a shift in how, you know, the Canadian political mainstream deals with indigenous issues. But back then, and you know, going back 100 years or more, it was always just Ottawa design solutions imposed from the outside and then put on indigenous communities, right? And then indigenous people like resisting or rejecting those policies as best they could. But what I'm hopeful for now is that we say, yeah, that doesn't work. And Ottawa design solutions are not the way forward. Rather, we should be talking about locally designed solutions. We should be talking about solutions that originate from the indigenous nations themselves. Right? And there's a few potential governments that are talking like that. So hopefully, they, if they are able to form government, they live up to the rhetoric and they actually work in partnership with Indigenous peoples. And I think that is really what the, the TRC report is trying to get at when it talks about things like use the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Right? Use that in the business world. Use that in the legal world as a framework for working with indigenous communities. Because what the United Nations Declaration says, you know, well, it deals with a lot of things like land and language and you know, resource development. But like at its heart are two ideas. One, it says that every people, everybody has the right to self-determination, indigenous people included. But like, you know, we as a Canadian society, we have a right to self-determination but also indigenous nations have a right to self-determination, right? And unless that's respected and that agency is, is, is part of the process, you're not gonna have a, a real success. And then the other thing that they say is free prior informed consent, right? Indigenous communities, the consent of indigenous communities should be obtained before anything is done that's gonna <coughs> infringe on their rights, right? So that's what the TRC is pointing us as the uh, standard that we should abide by the Supreme Court has moved in that direction as well. Because the other thing the Chilcotin decision said, in addition to recognizing Aboriginal title for the Chilcotin people, they said that in areas where Aboriginal title still exists, that the standard is not consultation. The standard that the government needs to use in its engagement is consent. There is a requirement to obtain consent. So right now, that applies literally only in the Chilcotin nation's territory. Right? But the door is open for any group that can claim Aboriginal title or could prove Aboriginal title to make the same claim. What does that mean? Well, that means a huge chunk of British Columbia, a huge chunk of the North, a huge chunk of Quebec, and Atlantic Canada. Right? So that would be a very different form of government, governance, right, in Nova Scotia if the province said, well, yeah, for sure we want to do this, but we've got to seek the consent of, uh, you know, the Mi'kmaq Nation first, or the Maliseet Nation first. Right? So I think it's happening, that move. Government is becoming more... Um, it is carrying out its requirement to engage with Indigenous communities more, 
But the reason we, have, we still have these long-lasting issues is because that, that's never really um, taken hold yet. But the more that that's used, the better outcomes we'll see. And then the other thing, too, is the political will. There's, in the past, been zero political will to act on these things, but I think there is more now. Not just for Indigenous people, but non-Indigenous Canadians as well, I think are, for the most part, say, like, it's enough. Like, let's do, let's do the right thing here and let's fix the relationship. Yeah, I'm in favor of it. I think in my lifetime the Constitution will be opened up. And what I would, I know there's a lot of things that will probably be dealt with. One, we should deal with Quebec, right? Like they, I think all of us go to Quebec and we feel like we're in a distinct society when we get there. So why not recognize that in the Constitution? I think we could get rid of the monarchy. I'm not sure what we get out of having the Queen as a head of state. I'm not sure what we get out of having a GG or an LG in the provinces. Right? Like the real safeguards to our democracy and our, and our country's tradition is having a secret ballot, is having a free press, and is having civil liberties. It's not about having a monarch as a head of state. So I think we can get rid of that. The Senate, what's going on with the Senate? <laughs> we don't need to abolish it, but we should probably have an elected Senate, right? That's representative of the different regions in the country. So I think all those things over time will lead to the Constitution being opened up. But the indigenous people need to be dealt with in that equation, right? Because right now, indigenous people are part of the British North America Act, right? Like the artifact of the old Constitution that continues to exist in our new Constitution. We're under Section 9124 as part of federal jurisdiction. So Indians and lands reserved for Indians are placed under federal jurisdiction. That has big impacts on uh, people's lives. Like my father, for instance, um, he died of cancer. He would have been eligible for a provincial drug, cancer drug program in Manitoba. He was prescribed a specific form of chemotherapy that would have been covered by the province, but he was denied because he was a status Indian. Right? And it's because of Section 9124. And I'm not pointing the finger, that's not why he died. Like our family, we have resources. We could have paid for the drug himself, ourselves. But he said, you know, I'm going to make a quality of life decision. I'm going to accept a shorter time here on earth to have a clearer mind and more energy while I am here. So I'm not pointing the finger, but I'm just saying that's a clear example of a systemic inequity that exists as a result of the structure of the Canadian Constitution. Right? So how do we remedy that? Well, I think it's what you're suggesting. We remove indigenous people, indigenous nations, governments from Section 9124, from out of federal provincial jurisdiction, and we have it as a separate order of government. Right? So you have federal, provincial, indigenous. Right? And so that's what I'm in favor of, and that's what I hope happens in my lifetime. Kyler, do we have any questions from Twitter? No? Good, we're good then. No, it's good. Sure. Yeah, like ours, as with other indigenous nations, sees the adoption as a very important ceremony, right? So we call it Nabugonde Win, the Lakota call it a Hunka ceremony. And the idea is, you know, when you lose a loved one, you are able to bring somebody else into your life to help fill that role. So you're not replacing the, the loved one that you lost, but you're creating a new outlet for that love that you have in your heart to be directed towards. That's the idea behind it, right? And as such, it's also used as a peacemaking ceremony, right? So for instance, like if two warring nations, you know, the leaders of their nations had lost a relative in conflict, they might adopt one another, right? And so the outlet for their uh, missing loved one would then also be used towards the objective of peacemaking and bringing those two communities that had been at war before back together. That's the origin of the ceremony. This is, I think, a unique application of that 
ceremony and that tradition, which is to use it to advance reconciliation. Meaning, we've been in conflict in the past, you know, we've been done wrong, but now we're going to work it out. We're going to sort it out through thick and through thin. Right? We're going to take one another as kin, and in this way, the familial ties that bind will prevent either of us from run running away from this task of reconciliation and ensure that both of us stay here. Right? And to me, like, that was part of the genius of what my father did in his life. Right? Because now I have this Uncle Jimmy, right? <laughs> James Weisgerber, Archbishop James Weisgerber, right? His grace. And uh, now we have a relationship there. And to me, reconciliation, it's not the national chief and the prime minister shaking hands. It's something that needs to happen in a tangible way. It's not a symbolic up here sort of thing. It's a right here thing between two people. Right? And so it began with my father and his new brother, the Archbishop. Now, even though my father is gone, it continues with me and him, my sister and him, you know, my mom and him, his family and our family. And we're learning about each other, you know, and we're reconciling. Right? So I think it's a remarkable model. You know? But I think there's other ways to do it too. You know? Just inviting people over for dinner, you know, having conversations putting yourself outside of your comfort zone and attending cultural practices, cultural ceremonies for other people, you know, and vice versa. You know. So I like that a lot. And what I would hope that happens, going back to the other question, is that it's not just a native and church people thing, but we have that intercultural dialogue happening in a variety of areas, and I see it. Like tonight, actually, in Winnipeg, there's a local anti-violence movement called Meet Me at the Bell Tower, which is a group of young indigenous kids from like the poorest neighborhood in the province of Manitoba, who've stood up against violence every week and reclaimed their neighborhood uh, for the past five years on Friday nights. What are they doing tonight? They're hosting the Islamic Social Services Agency of Manitoba, right? And they've invited that group to come down and to speak to them. So I hope that there's opportunities for intercultural dialogues across, you know, indigenous, Islamic, indigenous, Christian, Jewish, indigenous, you know, and that those pollinate in every possible direction, right? And even not just with the faith world too, because so many of us don't really follow a given spirituality or religious tradition now. So many of us are secular humanists or just, you know, atheists that I hope that there's also a way for us to come together on those terms and figure out what is it that we share, right? Yeah. Um, I feel like there is a loss of interest in our Aboriginal culture about um, being who they are and who they as Aboriginal. How do we fix that? I think it's the opposite from what I see. Like, um, when I go to Pine Ridge, South Dakota, they tell me there's 70 Sundances there now in July and August from like one in the 1960s, right? You go, especially in Eskasoni, you guys have young people speaking the language, right? So I don't know. I know there is some young people who don't understand the importance of speaking a language, but I would encourage them to reconsider and to think otherwise. And I think that's probably a failure on the part of the older generation, like mine, in communicating to the younger people the importance and the wisdom and the beauty encoded in the language. But overall, we're in a time of an indigenous resurgence, right? Like John A. MacDonald, Duncan Campbell Scott, they're rolling in their graves right now. <laughs> Right? Every time a non-native kid puts on a Tribe Called Red t-shirt and salutes a Carey Price poster before they go out the door on the way to school where they learn about residential schools in the Canadian public school system, they do another 360 underground. <laughs> you know? Culture is always moving, culture is always fluid, culture is always adapting. Right? So it may be that some parts of traditional culture uh, get left behind. But overall, that central core of the indigenous community 
what our community has managed to hang on to, even in spite of oppression, even in spite of challenges, that remains there. And I'm not worried about us losing that. Yeah. But I think it is important for us also to understand, I think more directly to your point, that that doesn't happen by accident. We have to be intentional and we have to say that that's important to us and we're going to make it continue far into the future. One other nation that I Sundance with, there's a Ponca, the Ponca people from Oklahoma. They're not originally from Oklahoma. They were relocated there during the Trail of Tears. Their ancestors had to march thousands of miles, right, to their new homeland in Oklahoma at gunpoint by the U.S. government. But what they tell me is that one of their grandmas marched that whole way with the rocks from her sweat lodge tied up in a bundle and slung on her back. So this old lady, right? She marched thousands of miles with like rocks on her back, probably weighing, you know, hundreds of pounds maybe. Well, maybe 100 pounds to be realistic, right? Why did she do that? She did that because she believed that you were worth it. She believed that I was worth it to fight to keep these ways alive, to preserve that beauty and that tradition, right? And so we have to understand that the sweat lodge that they have didn't survive by accident. It survived because that lady made a tremendous sacrifice and did a huge, huge toil to make sure that it lived. And so the question to us, whether we're indigenous or we're members of another cultural group that has traditions that we want to preserve, is that's what the generations that came before it did for us. What are we going to do for the next generation? So unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions. Um, but I would like to thank Wab again and invite Mary up to thank him further um, for the wisdom, for the message of peace, and the message of hope that we received tonight. All right, miigwech. Wab. Miigwech. 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 Wow. <laughs> Something about exceeding expectations, which were already high. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to get into that right now because we have something really special right at this moment. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. June Weber, the Vice President of St. of X and Director of the Cody Institute, and Gord Cunningham, the Assistant Director of Cody, to come forward. They're going to make a special presentation to Wab Canoe. See those guys up there? Do they look alike? Thanks, Mary. <laughs> what a wonderful, Good to see wonderful you again. presentation. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you so, so much. And as you said, and as Mary has just said, you are the second generation canoe to, uh, to offer your wisdom and your experience and share it with uh, this community. And uh, we wanted to take this opportunity to honor your father mm. this time here and uh, at the same time share with you a little bit of that history. So uh, in 1966, a, a very young man at the time named Peter Kelly, that was his designated name, or Toban Sanaquat. Toban Sanaquat. Toban Sanaquat Canoe, as he was rightly known, completed a course of studies in fieldwork in, as the, dip the diploma stated at that time, educational techniques. I think it might be on, but... I'll hold it closer. Okay, thanks. As the diploma stated, educational techniques prescribed by the faculty of the Cody International Institute as basic preparation for positions of trust in organizations for social betterment. betterment. We've changed those names. <laughs> Wab, well, your father was one of the many esteemed First Nations, Métis and Inuit participants, along with Bill Erasmus, a national chief of the Dene Nation, and Mikitrachuk Hansen, past commissioner of Nunavut, and Chief Terry Paul of the member two First Nation who have graduated from Cody. Indeed, since 2011, more than 70 First Nations, Métis and Inuit participants have graduated from Cody's on-campus ca courses. Our programs are designed to support and equip practitioners, policymakers, and community leaders with the tools, 
principles and methodological approaches needed to bring about the change they want for themselves and to discover new ways to help their communities achieve their goals. Over the years, we continued our learning journey with the Indigenous communities. Five years ago, we created the Indigenous Women's and Community Leadership Program, headed by Robin Bourgeois, who's sitting right at the front here, under which we brought more than 80 emerging Aboriginal women leaders to this campus. We've also begun work directly with several of these graduates to be able to offer some CODI courses in their communities, such as the one on asset-based community development and community visioning, my colleagues Tanya Wasikase, are you here, Tanya? And Gord, up there? No. And Gord Cunningham here with me this evening, delivered in Rama First Nation this past summer. We recognized how difficult it is for many Aboriginal community leaders to leave their communities for extended periods of time. Your father, for example, was here for nine months. So Cody has designed a number of shorter offerings here on campus that will allow Aboriginal participants to share their experiences with participants from around the world. Mwab, um, I had the honor of meeting your father in 2010. I didn't know him, but um, you said a few things about him, but I'd like your permission to say a few more things. Um, he was a chief. Well, he, I'll go back further. He, he was born on a trap line, and you mentioned his experience in residential schools. And in spite of all uh, of that experience, that traumatic experience, he became the first regional chief for Ontario for the Assembly of First Nations. He went on to become the Grand Chief of the Grand Council of Treaty 3. He became a teacher. He, became, he was on faculty at the University of Winnipeg on the Indigenous School of Governance and the Masters in Development Practice. And I guess uh, maybe most importantly to this event that's on common ground, building common ground, he was a conciliator. You, you mentioned him adopting the Archbishop and his trip to the Vatican. He was what we would call at Cody a gapper. Somebody who straddled the gap, not just between face, but between peoples, between generations. And he has much to teach us. And I think we've had many, many illustrious graduates at the Cody Institute, but we all agree that we count your father among the most important graduates. So we are here to honor him with a little uh, gift. Um, we have his original diploma that we are giving you that says Peter Kelly on it. That's and we have done a new diploma with Tobasanaquit Kinu. Wow. That's amazing. Just stand up here so it better. amazing. We also have documents. Yes. <laughs> wow. Uh, the staff went through the files and found all of the documents that uh, from his registration. You still have them. We do. <laughs> you guys better behave. You see that? <laughs> 50 years from now, one of your kids will be here and they'll pull out your transcript. One of the most remarkable things here is a piece that your father sent from the Winnipeg Press about the conditions of First Nations in that community in mm. 1965. So here they are with his marks and everything else. Amazing. <laughs> well, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. This is wonderful. It's amazing. I couldn't have asked for a more thoughtful and a more poignant gift. Wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, Wob, you're about to get another gift, and so I'd like to invite Shanna up uh, to thank Wob um, and give him a gift that she's made. I want to talk first. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but that made me tear up. <laughs> um, 
Well, first of all, Wab could have been anywhere tonight, and he chose to be here with us to share his knowledge and his wisdom. And to touch on the residential school, it hits home for a lot of us. Sorry. And for you to open up that door of truth, that gives us inspiration and hope to a better future. So on behalf of St. Effects, all our local communities, our students, Wallaliak.disyak. Wallaliak. Can I open it? Whoops. So every time you see it, think of me. I made it. <laughs> Kidding. Not kidding. No. <laughs> but not really. <laughs> Amazing. I made that. Well, awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you. Good job, too. John yeah. Girl. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, thanks again. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much.